the battle for the skies over war-torn Europe was one of, if not the, most crucial theater of war against Nazi Germany. The strategic bombing campaign carried out by the Allies grew in strength with every passing year, until literally thousands of four-engined heavy bombers like the American B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-24 Liberator blotted out the sun a day. At night, British and Canadian planes turned the darkness into an orange glow of flame as their bombs ignited below. However, an often overlooked part of this story is the small but intriguing contribution of the Soviet Union in the story of the overall bombing campaign. Not possessing a vast armada of four-engined heavy bombers, the Soviet story is instead one of symbolic retribution for as Germany's armies seemed unstoppable in the opening months of Operation Barbarossa, Soviet aircraft battled the odds to prove to their people that the fascists were not invincible. This is the story of Stalin's dramatic 1941 bombing campaign against the Nazi capital that came as his own capital was increasingly under threat from being overrun by German troops. Welcome to Wars of the World. On June 22nd, 1940, an aircraft unfamiliar to the Soviet capital's inhabitants was spied droning overhead. It was a Luftwaffe Junkers Ju-88D bomber, tasked with conducting a photographic reconnaissance of the city, and in doing so, became the first German aircraft to reach Moscow. Over the coming month, Luftwaffe reconnaissance missions would increase in frequency, allowing German commanders to build up an intricate picture of the city and monitor the progress of its defensive preparations as the Wehrmacht advanced. On July 18th, 1940, the intelligence picture the German aircraft had built up of the city was presented to Chief of the General Staff of the German Army, Generalabust Franz Halder, who identified a number of high-value targets for an aerial bombing campaign. Such targets included rail and road junctions to disrupt the flow of supplies into the city, the Moscow hydroelectric power plants, several armament factories, and numerous symbolic targets, such as the Kremlin, the seat of Soviet power. Having presented these to Hitler, the next day, on July 19th, the Führer signed Directive OKH No. 33, which authorized a series of air raids on Moscow in preparation for the ground assault to take Stalin's capital city. The air campaign against Moscow was dubbed Operation Clara Zetkin, after the founder of the German Communist Party, and there were mixed reactions from some of the Luftwaffe leadership. Head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring, viewed it as vital to the overall campaign against the Soviets, even if only for propaganda and prestige purposes. The head of the Luftwaffe's No. 8 Flieger Corps, General Richhoven, relished the idea of bombing Moscow, believing that the terror such attacks would instill would collapse Stalin's regime despite the fact similar notions had failed to achieve success against the British the year before. However, General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring was more skeptical of the plan's success. He knew the Luftwaffe bomber fleets were spread pretty thin, flying tactical operations in support of the army, helping to keep the Wehrmacht advancing eastwards. He therefore questioned the validity of the raids at this point in the campaign, given that it would divert bombers away from this vital task, and pointed out that the Luftwaffe's bomber fleet was ill-suited for such a long-range strategic bombing campaign. He also expressed concerns over what might happen to his men if they were shot down and captured by enraged Soviet citizens. Hitler would not be dissuaded, however, and on July 21st, 1940, crews that would comprise a force of 127 Luftwaffe bombers were briefed on their targets for the raid that would take place that night. With no bomber bases close to the front lines, the German twin-engine bombers would have to fly from airfields as far west as occupied Poland and even East Prussia, which severely limited their bomb load, with some aircraft barely able to carry 1,000 pounds of ordnance. At around 20 hundred hours Moscow time, the German bombers began forming up over Poland and then driving eastward towards Moscow. At 2110 hours Moscow time, 
air raid sirens rang out, and anti-aircraft guns were armed and trained skyward. The first German aircraft over the city were Heinkel HE 111s, which proceeded to drop photo flash and incendiary bombs, which illuminated the targets for the waves of bombers that were to follow. The German raid met stiffer resistance than was anticipated, but the anti aircraft gunners were poorly coordinated, meaning even as German bomber crews found their aircraft illuminated by searchlights, they were often left completely unchallenged. By the time the raid was over, more than 1,000 fires had been started throughout the city, causing wide scale disruption while a single bomb scored a direct hit on the Kremlin. But amazingly, the fuse malfunctioned and it failed to explode, either unintentionally in the chaos of the night's events or deliberately in order to avoid reprisals from Stalin. The commanders of the anti-aircraft gunners made wildly exaggerated claims over how many German bombers they had brought down. In reality, only two German planes were lost during the mission, leading to the Germans declaring the raid a success and more would follow in the coming days. Despite the damage done in the raid being quickly repaired, Stalin was outraged by the German attack and demanded that the citizens of Hitler's own capital, Berlin, be punished for it. This, he believed, would help temper the growing anger and fear spreading amongst Moscow's population now they were under direct air attack. Stalin's own air commanders were less than enthusiastic to take on this new assignment, although they dared not disobey the Soviet dictator. If Stalin told you to do something, you did it. The problem was that Berlin was even further away from the Soviet airfields than Moscow was for the German bomber fleet in Poland. Like the German Luftwaffe, the Soviet Air Force, the VVS, was tailored predominantly towards tactical operations in support of the Red Army, and was so mostly comprised of medium-range, twin-engine planes. However, they did possess a handful of longer-range types, and one four-engined long-range bomber, which could possibly deliver the retaliation Stalin demanded. The Petlyakov PE-8 was to have been the backbone of a new four-engine strategic bomber force, but in the end, only 93 examples would ever be built at a ridiculously slow rate over eight years. Ironically, it was Stalin himself who had curtailed the Soviet Union's strategic bomber program, as prior to the outbreak of the war, he had dismissed the concept as fanciful, a dream concocted by thinkers, whereas the tactical bomber was a combat-proven concept. Entering limited service in 1940, the bomber was designed to showcase the Soviet Union's ability to project air power over long ranges, but in reality, it served primarily as a propaganda tool, while operationally, it was seldom used to attack anything the tactical bombers could not. Powered by four 1500 horsepower engines, it had performance broadly equivalent to early British Avro Lancasters, although only when flying with a significantly smaller bomb load, and that's not to mention that the engines were plagued by reliability issues. Plans were quickly formulated for the retaliatory raid, but the VVS was not the only branch of the Soviet armed forces equipped with long-range bombers. The Soviet Navy also possessed long-range types for attacking shipping in the Baltic Sea, and this included the Ilyushin DB-3F, which, with a combat range of 1400 miles, could in theory attack Berlin from off the Estonian coast, a location that was technically behind German lines when compared to the situation in the motherland. Thus, the Navy and Air Force began to study the feasibility of such an attack in order to satisfy Stalin's demand. The first major obstacle was that the only airfield on the island off the coast of Estonia was too short for bombers, and so had to be lengthened as quickly as possible. Then the necessary supplies would have to be ferried there by sea to support the bombers, a dangerous prospect given the threat of a vast array of mines the Germans had laid in the region in an attempt to contain the Soviet fleet. On August 2nd, 1941, DB-3Fs of the 1st Mine and Torpedo Aviation Regiment of the 80th Air Brigade of the Baltic Fleet Air Force took off fully loaded from Leningrad to test the new runway. Landing safely, the bomber crews quickly got to work learning the route they would take to and from Berlin. The whole operation was conducted under the strictest of secrecy, the kind only the Soviet Union could possibly enforce. Then finally, on August 7th, 1941, the Soviet naval pilots were ready to strike back at Berlin.
At 2100 hours, the DB-3Fs began lifting off and into the night sky. In total, 13 aircraft set off for Berlin, forming up into three groups. Operating at the extremes of the aircraft's range, they had to fly the shortest route possible, and this took them over the German Baltic ports of Stettin and Schweine-Osten before heading straight to Berlin. Operating in total radio silence, the flight was nothing short of arduous for the bomber crews, who had to fly significantly higher than they were accustomed to in order to escape detection en route by German searchlights. The DB-3Fs were not ideally suited for such high altitude flights, and the crews had to contend with bitter temperatures, plummeting to below 35 degrees Fahrenheit, with nothing but their flying garments to keep them warm and they fought a constant battle against frost and ice building up on the windows, and even the instruments in the cockpit. Cruising through eastern Germany, the formation was eventually spotted by German observers, but the thought that the Soviets were launching an air raid this far west was so unthinkable that the German commanders assumed they were Luftwaffe planes returning from an operation. Some even attempted to signal the Soviet bombers with lamps, believing they might be lost Heinkels. It was after 100 hours when the Soviet planes approached Berlin. The bomber crews later reported numerous streetlights illuminating the great city below, which aided them in finding their aim point, the industrial center of the city. Clearly, the Germans had been caught completely by surprise, and at 130 hours, the bombers began dropping their relatively light loads before quickly turning for home. The bombers' detonations quickly woke the city up to the danger, and the sky soon filled with exploding anti-aircraft shells, but to no avail, as the Soviet planes were already escaping eastward. Breaking radio silence, radio operator Vasily Kratenko broadcast the famous patriotic words, My place is Berlin. The task has been completed. We are returning to base. One by one, in the early hours of the morning, all 15 DB-3Fs began returning home, their fuel tanks almost as empty as their bomb bays. News of the successful attack spread like wildfire, thanks to the ever-efficient Soviet propaganda machine, and after months of bloodshed and bitter retreat, Soviet spirits were sent soaring. Despite the fact the bombing achieved negligible damage, after seeing the impact it had on his people, Stalin demanded more of what he termed as morale raids to keep the Soviet people defiant against the Nazis and inspire them to resist until their last breath. In contrast, back in Berlin, the German leadership was so aghast at the idea of Soviet bombers hitting their city that at first they refused to believe it, blaming the raid on the British, who had attacked the city numerous times since August 1940. It came down to the British Broadcasting Center emphasizing that the RAF had not carried out the attack to make the German command finally accept the fact that they had been caught off guard by the Soviets, a people they considered inferior to themselves. Wasting little time, the following night, the DB-3Fs were again on their way to Berlin to repeat their feat. Only this time, they were supported by additional aircraft from the VVS. Meanwhile, the PE-8 heavy bombers were made ready for their first mission against the Nazi capital. Operating under the command of the 432nd Heavy Bomber Regiment, the PE-8 unit was comprised of pilots with the most experience in long-range flying from all corners of the Soviet Union regardless of their background, and these included a number of pilots from the Soviet state airline Aeroflot. The mission was to be commanded by Major General Vodopyanov, a hero of the Soviet Union. Vodopyanov planned to fly from their base at Pushinko outside Leningrad, around the coastlines of Estonia and Latvia, and then dash across the Baltic to Berlin. This route, he reasoned, gave them the best chance at avoiding interception by the Luftwaffe's night fighters, who were now hunting for the Soviet bomber crews, but it also meant they would have to fly a distance of 1,680 miles to the target, which would only be possible with a significantly reduced cruising speed of just 176 miles per hour to preserve fuel. As was common practice for long-range bombing missions of this nature, Vodopyanov requested to have a secondary target for them to bomb if they found themselves unable to reach or locate Berlin. Stalin was initially angered by this, before authorizing him to bomb Stettin if that became the case. However, Stalin reiterated that Vodopyanov and his men must reach Berlin, and it was said in such a way as to imply that anything else would not be tolerated. Taking off at dusk on August 11th, 1940, 
the flight of 14 PE-8s would be joining the DB-3Fs, making another attack on Berlin, as well as a force of long-ranged twin-engine medium bombers from the VVS. Right from the start of the operation, the PE-8s seemed cursed with misfortune. As the fully fueled up bombers began taking off, a PE-8 suffered the loss of two engines on the same wing, causing the aircraft to pitch over onto its side and crash, killing all 11 men on board. Heading out to the Baltic Sea, the bombers then found themselves targeted by a flight of Russian I-16 fighters unfamiliar with the four-engine bombers and mistaking them for Germans, although fortunately without loss. Then, Soviet anti-aircraft gunners opened up on them, bringing down a PE-8 and crashing it into the Sea of Tallinn. The Soviet bombers had yet to enter enemy territory, and already they had lost two of the four-engined heavies. Next, another PE-8 suffered an engine fire over Poland, which the crew successfully extinguished, but with only three engines, it started lagging behind the others, and so its pilot elected to bomb the secondary target of Stettin, with the aircraft losing another engine on the way there. Despite only having two engines, the now considerably lighter PE-8 managed to limp home, landing safely just outside of Leningrad. The remaining PE-8s pressed on, misfortune still seemingly going with them, as just 12 minutes from his targets, Vodopyanov also suffered the loss of an engine, just as German anti-aircraft fire began lighting up the sky. Fighting with the controls, he pressed on with his crew until they reached their aim point and released their 8,818 pounds of bombs on the city below. Freed of the burden of carrying this weight, the plane became more responsive and he turned to escape the city's defenses. However, they did not come off unscathed, as shrapnel from the exploding anti-aircraft shells had peppered the bomber and punctured the fuel tank. Realizing he no longer had the fuel necessary to fly the planned route home, he instead ordered his navigator to set them on the most direct route possible back to Leningrad, flying over hundreds of miles of German-occupied territory, patrolled by German night fighters looking for revenge. Luckily, they managed to avoid interception. Battling poor weather, which further hampered his bomber's progress, Vodopyanov's navigator reported that they were less than 30 minutes from their base when all four engines, now starved of fuel, shut down. Vodopyanov managed to crash land in a wooded area just short of the front lines, and he and his 10 comrades were able to walk away from their downed bomber back to Soviet forces. Other PE-8s also found themselves running low on fuel during the flight home, three making crash landings short of Pushinko, while one landed on a flat bit of ground near a tractor factory, where the crew used buckets to refill their aircraft's diesel engines before taking off again to complete their journey home. One PE-8 got lost and wound up flying over Finland, where it was shot down, killing all but two of the crew, who managed to bail out and were taken prisoner. In total, just four PE-8s had completed the mission as planned. However, the rest of the Soviet forces had also been through the mill that night, struggling to get airborne with a full bomb load from an unpaved runway. Of the twin-engine bombers, only three managed to take off and join in the raid, after which two were mistakenly shot down by Soviet air defenses on the return leg of the mission, while the third disappeared into the darkness and was never seen again. While the Soviet propaganda machine continued to sing the praises of the bombings, Vodopyanov was immediately summoned to Moscow to meet with Stalin and answer for the woeful performance of his bomber crews. Tired and frustrated, his tone was not as tempered as most who found themselves in front of the communist dictator, and he launched into a breakdown of what had gone wrong. Put simply, the whole night had been a demonstration of the immaturity of the VVS's long-range capabilities. Vodopyanov highlighted how the secrecy of the mission had led to Soviet air defenses being as big a threat to them as the Germans, since no one else knew they were going to be flying that night. He also told them that had radio beacons been installed at Pushinko for the bombers to follow home, more aircraft would have made it back, but instead fuel was wasted by the crews fumbling around in the darkness, trying to get their bearings. Finally, however, he was most scathing of the ACH-30B diesel engines used in the PE-8, which had proven so unreliable that he implied it was almost criminal to send men into the air with them. He reportedly told Stalin he was ready to tear them out of the PE-8s with his teeth, a brave statement since Stalin had been one of the supporters of the engine during the bomber's development. Despite his reputation for disposing of those who seemed to criticize him, 
Stalin seemed prepared to listen to Vodopinov, and with the heavy bomber regiment out of commission following its losses, work began on finding a suitable replacement engine, with Soviet engineers settling on the AM-35A V-12, which was in production for the MiG-1 and MiG-3 fighters. Some PE-8s had already been tested with the engines, but now it was to become the standard. The 1350 horsepower AM-35A offered marginally reduced performance, including range, but it offered vastly greater reliability, and by the end of 1941, all PE-8s had been converted to fly with them, before the aircraft was re-engineered again in 1942, this time being fitted with new radial engines. Confidence in the PE-8 had been shaken after August 11th, and they would only carry out one more raid against Germany in 1941. Although their mission was less ambitious, being the German city of Konigsberg, and only involving three aircraft, all of whom returned home safely. Meanwhile, the DB-3Fs continued their campaign, but an angered Hitler demanded that the island they used as a base to be captured, to deny the Soviets its further use in bombing Germany. The tenth and last of Stalin's morale raids was carried out on the night of September 4th, after which the Soviets were forced to abandon the island in the face of an imminent German attack. With the situation concerning Moscow growing ever more perilous as 1941 went on, defending the city took precedence over thoughts of conducting a sustained bombing campaign on Germany. Fortunately for the Soviets, the city was spared German occupation, and as the tide began to turn the following year, operations against Berlin and other German cities resumed, albeit as a fraction of those being conducted by the Western Allies. Of all the bombs dropped on the Nazi capital during the war, Soviet aircraft accounted for less than 1% of the total. Stalin soon returned to his belief that tactical bombers were of prime importance in winning the war and viewed the costly strategic bomber fleets as unnecessarily wasteful in the grand scheme of things. Development of the PE-8 and other long-range heavy bombers thus ground almost completely to a halt, while the Western Allies began work on even bigger and better types, culminating in the ultimate World War II strategic bomber, the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. This lack of investment in strategic bombers would ultimately be to Stalin's detriment, for as soon as World War II ended and the Cold War began, he demanded his engineers start producing long-range bombers with which to threaten the Western powers. This requirement only grew in importance with the implementation of the Soviet atom bomb program, but Soviet engineers were some four years behind their Western counterparts, and so in the interim, they were forced to simply copy the B-29, producing the Tupolev Tu-4. This airframe was such a close copy that some of the early examples still had Boeing printed on the controls. And there you have the story of Stalin's bomber offensive against Berlin. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.